Hello, and welcome to the EGX De uh, Res Developer Sessions. Yes, I forgot the name of the show. Brilliant. Um, so um, at the end of this session, we'll hopefully have a bit of time for questions. Um, there's a microphone in the center of the room. Uh, there will be a spotlight on it, so you'll be able to see it. Um, if you have a question for Mike, uh, please queue up at the end of the session, and we'll get through as many as possible. So without further ado, Mike Bethel. Hello. It's a bit weird following Carmageddon. I like that. I need the funky music from when we were sitting down playing the whole time I'm doing this. If we can just bring that up, it was good. Anyway, um, hello. Um, I'm Mike. Um, I made a game called Thomas Was Alone, which was about rectangles with emotions and stuff. Did anyone in the room buy that game? Was that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're, you paid for this. Um, so I, I appreciate your, your time and your effort and your money. Uh, it's very kind of you. Um, I'm very sorry, by the way, the low err in the room. That is because there is a background noise in this game, which is like an air con, kind of to signify the cool tech environment you're in. Through these speakers, it sounds like everyone's got a really bad rumbling tummy, um, which doesn't like the kind of mood I want, but we'll go with it. Uh, so this is volume. Um, the, uh, it's my second game. Um, it was the second game I wanted to make after Thomas was alone, um, because there was two genres I was really into, platformers, I kind of did that. And the other one was stealth games. I was a massive fan of the kind of the kind of late 90s, Thief, Metal Gear Solid, those kind of pure stealth games that occurred back then. Um, and I was kind of excited to try and make my own. Uh, it feels like stealth has broadened. Uh, we've got stealth games that do a lot of really interesting stuff, but it feels like every cool new thing we add to the stealth genre takes it a little bit away from the stuff that I loved, which is the kind of sneaking around in corners, uh, trying to avoid vision cones stuff. Um, so that was the plan, was to do something like that. Uh, the other key thing was to remove the idea of killing from the game. That's not a big political statement. Um, although after that Carmageddon trailer, I kind of feel maybe I do need to make that statement. Um, that was awful. It was like really violent, scary. It was a great looking game, but were. Um, in this case, it's more actually because players choose the optimal path. When you play a video game, even if you're not aware of it, even if you're not a nerd like me, you're going to find the easiest way through that environment. You're going to find out the way that you can get to the end of the level as efficiently as possible. And if you are like me, that happens very quickly. I play a stealth game. I don't really play stealth games. I play walk up behind the bad guy and bop him on the back of the head games. Um, I'm not using the mechanics in the games. I end every stealth game with a bag full of awesome gadgets that I never used. It's kind of the first person shooter, box full of grenades problem. Um, you're always waiting for that right moment. So again, trying to do that, trying to do a stealth game that didn't push you into that optimal path, that removed that path so you could do interesting stuff. So I'm gonna show you some of it. Uh, this is a very buggy build. This is my GDC build uh, from last week. I was showing it to press. Press who could edit out all the horrible bugs from their videos. We don't have that luxury today, so you're gonna have to just stick with me and let's see how it goes. So I'll start off by showing you, um, what shall I show you first? We're gonna jump ahead. You guys all know that bad guys in games shoot you if they see you, right? We don't need to cover that ground. Okay, no, it's cool, it's cool. I've got a level specifically to show people that if I think they need it. But I can tell you're a smart crowd. I'm gonna move the cursor from the middle of the screen so this looks a bit more professional. Um, it's running on a PS4, honest. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to show you the first level. Uh, well, actually, it's the fourth level on this demo. So this character here, this is Loxley. Uh, this is the character you play as in the game. Um, he's kind of my Robin Hood. It's the idea of what would a Robin Hood be now if Robin Hood were to emerge. And because I spend too much time on YouTube, I decided he'd probably be a YouTuber. Um, Robin Hood was always a show-off. It was always about looking clever in front of the world. He wanted to be seen to be helping the poor. Um, that was very important to him. He was kind of a rich kid showing off. And I figured, well, that guy's going to have a YouTube channel. No offense intended to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get crucified. Um, so the objective of every level is to move around. You collect all the gems. When you've collected all the gems, the exit opens up and you can leave the level. It's that simple. As with any video game, it's not that simple. Um, you get around the level, you can run around. Uh, you can whistle. You can probably hear that whistle over the low bass hum that we've got for this entire game because I didn't refactor the sound for this, but you get the idea. Uh, you can do the standard things of going into cover, sneaking around, that kind of old school stealth. 
The animation for that corner turn has been sat in my email inbox for about two weeks. Um, I'm wishing I'd done it now, I'm seeing it on the big screen, but let's just pretend that's to ease speed of play. Um, but crucially, uh, you have gadgets in the game, so you can pick up these objects. This is a bugle. None of these are violent, none of these allow you to kill enemies. Uh, they're all crowd control tools, they're all there to... Oh, just running into a wall there. They're all there to basically allow you to work your way around guards. You can see I've filled up my money bar there, which has opened up the exit, which is creating an even larger uh, base hum, uh, which is going to make you all a bit uncomfortable. But we're going to go for it. Uh, here, though, we have this enemy. Now, this enemy's a guard, and unlike most stealth games, he's a really good guard who knows to just keep watching. Uh, he's not going to walk off or have a cigarette. We have those enemies in here, but this guy, he's, he's actually paid attention at guard school. Um, so we need a way around him, but what I can do is I can use the bugle. Uh, which is this gadget here. You can see I'm using that line to aim. Basically, you aim, you press once, you press again, and it makes a noise. And the guards will walk over to where that noise comes from. So you can use that to distract them. So here I'm going to use it very simply just to get this guy out of the way. He'll go and investigate. I can get to the exit. He's going to turn, but it's too late because I've won. Right. <laughs> now I'm going to cheat, I'm going to show you a level that I demonstrated at Eurogamer in London in the hope that none of you played that demo. If you did, the next five minutes aren't going to be very entertaining, but we're going to keep going because we're here now and it's warm. Um, there we go. I changed the colour of the walls in the hope that people wouldn't notice. Um, so here we have a more complex environment, this is enemies patrolling. I'm going to pick up the same gadget as before, the bugle, but I'm going to have to use it a bit more intelligently this time. So let's grab that one, that was quite easy. Again, quite easy. These force fields here in front of me, these white blocks, enemies can walk through, but I can't unless I spend a little bit of time deactivating them, which opens up this space. I'll go in here, and I'm kind of out of the way of this guy. He can't see me, he's not near enough. But these guards down here could very much see me if I run towards them. Again, good guards. Um, but what I can do is I can use this to kind of redirect them out of that space. So I'm just going to wait for the guy on the left to move out of the way so I don't... Actually, I don't need to. I'm a good player. I've played this game a bit. So let's go there, make a noise. And I can make a noise down here. They'll go there. I can sneak past. They'll walk into that wall. Uh, but we'll ignore that. Uh, and we'll cut that out of any later versions of this video. Uh, you can see they've now there. But stupidly, I've caught the attention of this guy here. So I'll just let him kind of walk around. He's going to do his thing. But he'll eventually give up and I'm good. Um, they'll have slightly more voice clips in the final game than the same line over and over again. Uh, that's a lesson I've learned from a few recent stealth games. Uh, if I just leave them out there, I can go here, hide in this locker, wait for them to go back, and I've got those gems. That leaves me with just one more gem to get. Let's go around here. Should be okay. Nope, no, not okay, not okay, not okay, not okay. Let's let him go past. This way. Now you can see they're not very realistic AI, but that's that kind of old school stealth thing. That as long as you stay out of the vision cones, they have no awareness of you unless you make noise. I'm going to go into this corner here, which is kind of a dead zone which he can't see. I'll let him do his thing. He's not going to see me. Uh, he'll walk off. Once he's a distance away, I'm going to distract this guard into this corner. And hopefully I can get in and out before he sees me. But he's seen me, so he's going to chase me. But the exit's there. This guy's going to see me too, but screw it, right? And I'm out. Okay, I'll show you a couple more gadgets now, um, just because it's not all about that one bugle, um, as much fun as that is. Uh, you can see here the level of preparation, that these are all marked GDC, but the one at the bottom is called the res level. Uh, this was made yesterday, um, <laughs> so it's probably broken, but we'll see how it goes. I actually streamed the uh, production of this, so if you go to my Twitch channel, uh, you can actually watch me make this level, if that intrigues you. Okay, so the first gadget I've got here is the Ood. Uh, it's similar, oh dear, should have been paying attention. There we go, he's all good. I'm showing you the stealth mechanics. Um, the Ood is, uh, they're going to set off alarms and start investigating what just happened, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, oh no, that guy's coming around, okay. Um, okay, I should be alright. Um, so the Ood is, a, is sort of like the, uh, the Bugle from earlier, in that it makes a noise. But it's slightly different insofar as you stick it to surfaces. So I'm just going to stick it to this wall here. 
with a massive base tremor there. I apologize. Uh, that's going to stick to that wall. I'm going to go around now uh, to the other side of that wall that he's kind of so brilliantly guarding. Stay out. Oh, no. He's, he can't get to me. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, da -da 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 -da. Slide under this wall. Again, animation pending. Um, <laughs> this is an insight into game development that you're getting here. I hope you appreciate it. Um, I'm going to grab this gem here. I'm going to wait for this gentleman here to walk away. And I'm going to set off the noisemaker I planted a little bit earlier. Once he's gotten out of the way, I think that's fine. He'll go and investigate that. I'll grab this. Hide behind this wall. Got away with it. I'm just going to show you one more part of this level. Obviously, you're going to want some slightly more powerful abilities. Uh, you're not going to be able to kill anyone, as I said. I can use this to change rooms, to teleport, basically, across to there. Um, I've got the blackjack here. Now, the blackjack, thief fans will get the reference, hopefully. Uh, this knocks out enemies. But unlike most stealth games, it doesn't knock them out forever. It knocks them out for five seconds, uh, just because I'm a horrible person. So if I just knock this guy out there, he's going to go to sleep, giving me time to get around him. He's not going to wake up happy, though. Uh, he's going to wake up, he's going to wonder what the hell just happened to him. Uh, but that's fine, I'm already gone. Same with that guy. Um, I'm actually going to stop playing. Oh, no, actually, I'm going to win this level. Screw it. I can show off in front of a room full of people. I will. Um, do. Down there. Should be able to get away with this. Teleport back. And now I need to find the last gem, which I think... He's up here somewhere. No, other way. <laughs> it's way too many enemies in this level. Oh god! No, 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 no. Oh no, 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 no. Oh, 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 nearly got away with that. Right, this way. Uh, you can see when noises are made, it disrupts the level. Uh, to kind of show you where the noise is happening. Uh, kind of shatters the level, and also it just looks cool, to be honest. They're now investigating where I was. This guy is, I don't know what he's doing. He's patrolling back and forth here. As long as he doesn't turn that way, I should be all right. There we go. Grab that last gem. Oh, no, it's not the last one. The last one's up there. Okay, I'll wait for this guy to go past. And that horrible feeling in your innards uh, denotes that the exit's now opened. I'm going to go round. I'm going to get to the exit. Awesome. So, those are a few levels I've got here. I'm just going to quickly uh, show you the editor. A uh, big part of this, I want people to be able to make their own levels. Uh, stealth games are awesome. They're really fun to design levels for as well. Uh, but the problem with them is they're very complicated normally to design levels for because you've got a lot of AI stuff, a lot of complexity built in. The objective here really was to make um, an editor that's really straightforward to make stuff for. So it's as easy as drawing. So I'm just drawing the floor there. It's going to be a great level. Uh, yeah. Um, and then I'm going to change the color because this isn't quite working. I'm going to, I don't know why, but the, uh, the indicators at the top of the screen have gone. But you can see there that I'm kind of building out a level, make that a bit taller. I can put down, I can change the player's rotation, I can put down props. Uh, let's put down an enemy quickly. I'll have him go there. And he'll end there. And we'll play that. And he's going to do his thing. And I've built a level, and all the logic for that is working out as it goes, um, just based on the, the small amount of information I gave it. You can delve in, though, and you can do a lot more detail in terms of where enemies look, what happens. You can place down alarm systems so that NPCs know to work together. Uh, so you can really go in and create as much depth as you want within reason. You're not going to be able to make a first-person shooter in this engine. Um, it's not Little Big Planet. I don't have their funds, unfortunately, um, or their creativity. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's, it's coming along. So you can make your levels, you can share those. The story that's being told on top of this, the whole Robin Hood thing with the, uh, the AI who helps you, with the bad guy who taunts you, all of that stuff plays out on top of whatever levels you're playing, uh, which means that you can basically play the entire story through without ever seeing one of my levels, just playing community stuff. That's really important to me that this game can kind of live on, that you can replay the game and have different levels each time, all that kind of stuff.
Awesome. So I kind of rattled through that. The reason is usually I get quite a few questions, so I'd like to jump to that nice and quickly. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm ready, if Tom's there somewhere, to start doing, uh, start doing some quick uh, Q&A. Uh, the microphones, I think, are in the... Oh, here we go, spotlights. There is a microphone coming in. And anyone who wants to ask a question, I'm going to try and answer as many as I can. Yeah, just step up to the microphone if you want to ask a question. Uh, we should be able to get through quite a few. So just come and queue here at the microphone. Thank yes, you. come and go and queue. This can be very embarrassing until the first person goes up. Uh, could we get the volume on the game turned down? A oh, you have already. That's fine. I just want to make everyone ill from all the bass. <laughs> Should have got earplugs. Hello. 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 Uh, first, I want to say, big fan of Thomas was alone. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Uh, as a fan of stealth games, what do you feel about the current state of the stealth genre within the AAA mm -hmm. development scene? Uh, also, if you don't mind my asking, how do you find uh, working with Sony as a publishing partner? Cool. Um, so the first question, I just noticed a bug, by the way, that for some reason is drawing a blue triangle at the bottom of the screen. Um, ignore that. Um, so <laughs> the, first, the first question, uh, Stealth AAA. I love a lot of strip, uh, Stealth AAA games. I buy most of them. I love them. I'm actually one of the few people who quite liked The New Thief. I know that was a controversial game. You're shaking your head at me, but that's how I feel. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, so I quite like that game. Um, I do like Stealth AAA. I think the challenge they have is because they've got the AAA budget, they need to, or they perceive a need to appeal to a very big audience. And unfortunately, Stealth is a very niche genre. Uh, it's a very strange kind of person who looks at a room full of enemies and goes, how can I get around these guys without being seen? That's a weird way to look at the world. Um, I look at the world that way. I love those kind of games. But I think that we are a weird niche. So to me, the obvious solution to that is indie. Because I can make a game at a very low budget. Um, and I can sell it to, frankly, a very small number of people. I don't have to hit many tens of thousands, even, of sales to have paid for the game. Which is massively cool. Because it means that I get to make the kind of game that I think those, that small niche wants. Um, and you know, I get to pay my rent, which is equally important to me. Um, only equally important, um, <laughs> and, pay, and pay the rent of people who, who are working on it. Um, so there's that. So I think that's something that we can do. And there's a lot of very cool stealth indie games. You know, games like Monaco have already come out. There's Light, which is being demoed out there, which I'm massively jealous of. Their look, I think that looks amazing. It's a really, really solid looking game. And there's a whole bunch of us. Um, and I think that that's a cool thing. On the Sony question, they've been great. They're awesome. Um, yeah, they're looking after indies right now, and they're working with a bunch of different indies at different levels. I'd expect them, and this sounds arrogant, I'd expect them to be nice to me because I've made them money. Uh, that's a very not easy way of making companies be friendly to you. Um, but I'm seeing it at all levels. I'm seeing new indies coming up, making their first game, that are getting a ridiculous amount of support from Sony. So, so far, I'm loving the relationship, and I think they've been awesome. Cool, you cheated. You've got two questions. Get out of the way of the next guy. <laughs> Hello, Mike. Hello. Um... Are there going to be different enemy types in the game? There are. Once uh, my concept artist down there cool. bothers to draw any of them. <laughs> uh, he's in the audience there. He's in the shadows because he's shy. Um, but, well, I put it a different way. Once I tell him what the hell I want him to draw, uh, he'll draw them. Uh, yes, so there's, there's five enemy types in the game at launch. Um, what you've seen there is kind of the default patroller. Um, but there's different enemies. Enemies that uh, use melee attacks on you. Enemies who aren't actually violent themselves, but kind of set off alarms and bring other enemies to your position. All manner of different things. Um, yeah, they're not in this build right now, but they will be in the game uh, once I get my act together. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Hello. Um, first, just want to say I love the raw, basic stealth elements in the gameplay, though. It's simple but effective. Thank you. Um, so, the question though is, what is sort of like the ultimate goal for the game? Is it going to be, are you going to have like some kind of overarching story across levels, or is it more going to be a bit of a test bed? And with the having the game editor in there, you can sort of build out, spread out to the community, and have people set challenges. So the answer is yes, <laughs> um, but I feel I should extrapolate on that answer for you. Um, yeah, so it is yes. Basically both is the objective. I'm trying this because, with, so with Thomas Was Alone, Thomas Was Alone was a platformer that I thought was really good uh, with a story that I thought was kind of going to be okay enough. Turns out I was making the complete opposite game. 
um, <laughs> as, the, as the community very quickly told me. Um, I like telling stories. I'm going to move that cursor just to retain professionalism. Um, I like telling stories. I like, I like writing characters and telling you a very specific story with specific objectives that I have in terms of how I want to communicate. So the game will do that. The game has a beginning, a middle, and end story-wise. Um, the aim is hopefully for around three hours of story to happen. Um, but what I'm doing that's different and untested and could go terribly wrong is I'm not tying that story to the world you're exploring. You basically play this character, Loxley, who is wandering around this virtual environment, doing these missions, doing these jobs, simulating crimes against the rich, uh, and then broadcasting them so the poor can do as he shows them, which is a very interesting thing to experiment with from a story point of view. Is that okay? Is this guy a hero? That kind of question is an important part of what I'm doing with the game. That's all playing out. Uh, via voiceover, via, via in-game text, via various things. But it's not specifically tied to which level you're playing. Meaning that what I can do is I can go to community. I, obviously, I'll ship the game with some levels. Uh, <laughs> but in addition to the levels I'm making, uh, the community can build new levels. And then their levels could be played as part of someone else's single-player campaign if that person elects to. You can play a vanilla version, which is just all of my stuff. Um, and I'll thank you for it. I'll be, I'll be grateful. Um, however, I love the idea of people making their own stuff and that may be becoming the canonical version. Maybe in a year's time, or, or sorry, a year after the game's release, uh, maybe at that point, no one likes my levels. Maybe my levels are like the old boring levels, and but there's this amazing pack that you can get, um, which is the definitive kind of version and people recommend it. Or maybe you play my game through, um, you know, you play, you spend your three hours, you hear the story, all those cool voice actors doing their cool things. Um, but then, you know, six months later, you want to play it again. You can play that whole story through again, but with entirely different levels. I know that's something I'd love in single player games is if I could re, because I often want to replay single player games for the story, but I'm not that fussed about doing the same puzzle solutions that I already know. So hopefully I can kind of get the best of both worlds. And a big part of that is how the levels are saved. They're just text files. You could just, they're literally .txt files. They're all of the maps in a very human readable format, which means people can share them, chuck them in an email, or you know, use my official servers once I make them, um, and do your own thing. So, so hopefully freeing that up, because I love that stuff. I love people being able to do their own thing. I hope that answers it. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Hello. Hello. Um, the art style, it's very apparent. What, like, inspirations have you had for the, oh. like... So I'm going to take credit for my art team's work here. Yeah. One of them's in the room, but he's being quite quiet, so I should get away with it. Um, so, the, so the big brief, the idea was, so let me go back. The big thing visually that I loved and that I kind of wanted to emulate was um, I really like the Iron Man movies, and I want Tony Stark's basement. I want that hologram room that does all the crazy stuff. So I knew I wanted to make a game that you played in a kind of a virtual VR environment. At this point, I wasn't thinking about Metal Gear Solid VR missions. Obviously, there's some overlap there, but we've, we've, we're moving on. Um, <laughs> uh, so I knew I wanted that. So I wanted to do like a futuristic. There's no light over there. I'm going to come back here. This is, am I just messing with the lighting guy? When I come over here, does he turn something on? No. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to do futuristic. I wanted to... I'm being trolled now. Um, I wanted to be futuristic. I wanted to do something that was uh, kind of near future techy, um, but I also wanted to do the whole Robin Hood thing. So the real brief was basically just going and finding cool medieval things that we knew we wanted to reference and working out how you could kind of combine those with modern day stuff in order to create something that looked a bit weird and futuristic. Um, so so I, I bought Daz the Concept Ice every um, box set of Game of Thrones. Um, and, you know, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which has got some interesting ideas. Um, all this stuff, and we just kind of plowed through this medieval stuff. And what we found was there was loads of stuff that would look cool in a modern context. So as he's on the screen, I'll use Loxley as an example. He's there wearing um, a gauntlet, um, which is kind of, in our, in our narrative stuff, that's his kind of interaction with the world. But it looks like a gauntlet. It kind of hits into those keys. On his back, he's got the battery pack that powers all that kit, which is sort of in the location and shape of a quiver, that kind of stuff. Our enemies, those enemies you saw running around earlier, they're not firing guns, they've got crossbows, they're doing this kind of stuff. And what we found was the more we pulled in kind of medieval uh, fashion, design, art choices into our world, the more it started to look like a weird futuristic environment, and actually it kind of did our job for us to an extent. 
Um, so that was it, really. We just kind of tried to bring all that stuff together, and it's coming together. We've still got a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of stuff we want to do, um, but it's getting there. It's getting there. Thanks. Cheers. Uh, Hello. Hello. Um, uh, have you tried? Yes. Uh, you say that you uh, get inspiration from you know, Mega Solid, other stuff games. Uh, but what elements did you uh, come up with yourself? You know, what different that from? <laughs> None of it. None of it. It's all Obviously. stolen. It's a clone. I'm so sorry. I've been found out. Um, so what's interesting about doing a game which is kind of... I guess it's nostalgic to an extent in terms of how I'm designing it is it's the game that I wanted when I was 15. Um, is what you realize is your nostalgia is a lying, lying thing. It's not trustworthy at all. You go back to these games, you go back to that era, and you notice that there's a lot of stuff that, while awesome back then, doesn't make sense. Um, and you have to kind of update things and tweak things. A, a good example of this is uh, cover. So cover in a stealth game. Um, it's a really interesting challenge to get that right, because you want something that feels fluid and um, intuitive, but that you have complete control over. Because if you're... You know, if, you're, if you've got a guard right nearby, you don't want to have to guess whether you'll go into cover or not. You want an absolute certainty there. So in the, in the old Metal Gear Solid game, um, and in, well, Thief doesn't really do cover in the, kind of the original Thief games, but, well, it does, but you walk behind a thing. Um, Metal Gear Solid locks you into this cover, um, but it does it automatically when you push into that wall, which actually, when you go back and play, it doesn't feel great because you don't know where you're going. Um, also, the camera kind of comes into a really limited view or kind of down the corridor, which again, back in the late 90s, was incredible and cool and innovative. But now you go back and you're like, I kind of want to see what's going on. So in that specific case, I kind of stole the cover system, kind of similar to uh, Splinter Cell, but kind of simplified, the new Splinter Cells, in that you hold a toggle down to kind of keep you in cover. As long as you're holding that toggle, you're in cover. If you release it, you're out which just immediately made that feel more intuitive. And also when you go into kind of a corner view, it actually pulls out the camera uh, to kind of a top-down view. So it's that kind of stuff. It's more of an iteration. I'm not presenting this as the world's most innovative video game ever. It's clearly not. It's got a lot of roots in these old games. But hopefully I'm bringing some new stuff in terms of bringing it up to the modern day and making something that feels really good to play. That's the, the core for me. I spent a year making sure Thomas jumped right and Thomas was alone. This has been a nightmare of complexities for me to kind of get it feeling great. So I hope I'm doing that. We'll see. You're ultimately going to be the judge. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Afternoon, mate. You're right. Hello. You're Ooh. the chap who, who had a selfie taken with me earlier, aren't you? Embarrassingly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was lovely, I'm sorry by the to way. mention that in front of all these people. Um, but it was cool. I, look, I saw it. You tweeted it. Absolutely, yeah. I, well, I, I, just, I look really grumpy now. I think you caught me too early in the morning. I, th I think you look... Um, like a, you know, a very impressionable, sorry, a very important creative who I've bothered before he's had his bacon butty, maybe. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I wish more people had. <laughs> um, but <laughs> okay. we're wasting these people's time. Yeah. Questions, go on. Um, how did, um, if Tonus was alone, wasn't as successful as it turned out to be, how would that have affected volume? And <laughs> how will the success of volume uh, affect uh, how, well, the development of whatever comes next? Um, well, I mean, it's really simple. If Thomas Was Alone hadn't been a hit, there would be no volume. Um, Thomas Was Alone was a game I made in my evenings and weekends while having a day job. I was, it was a day job in the games industry. I was making games. I wasn't down a mine. It was an awesome job. Um, but I wasn't happy because I'm that guy. So I was like, yeah, I want to make my own game. Um, <laughs> the profound arrogance of the indie game developer. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so basically I made that in my own time. And it did well enough um, initially, but then it went kind of crazy and scary. And yeah, without that, without, frankly, the money it made and the visibility it got me, the fact that I would even get asked to talk on this stage is weird to me. Um, the fact that I would not prepare my audio assets correctly so that you would all get this horrible bass the entire time, equally weird. Um, but yeah, no, so volume kind of had to rely on that. Volume had to, everyone who bought the game paid for that. Um, little bits of it <laughs> each. Uh, and it's not an investment. Let's not go down the Oculus route. <laughs> I don't want to have controversy. Um, so, so Facebook aren't interested in buying face, Facebook have not even called. Okay. Um, which is frustration to me, but, you know, well, we'll see. If I keep tweeting so much as I do, maybe Twitter will get involved. I can get the other social network. Um, so, yeah, so basically, and then volume will again build up. Either volume will be a flop, and you're going to see a much smaller game from me next time, or the opposite, which I daren't even say, 
and you'll see a bigger game. Uh, my rule, and I've always been really open about this, my rule is that every game I make pays for two more games. So Thomas was alone, made enough money that I can make volume, and another game about as big as volume. The idea being that as long as half my games aren't rubbish, I can keep doing this indefinitely. Right. Um, and it will scale up, and it will scale up, and we'll see. And maybe, maybe, the next, maybe this game makes loads, and then you know, I make a much bigger game next time. Maybe it doesn't, and maybe I make a smaller game. Time's going to tell, and obviously, you know, buy my game. Um, <laughs> thank you. If um, I can just, just convince a few more thousand people to go along with you, I'll be all right. Just quickly, yeah. um, how long did you agonize over the name before you decided on Mike Bithell Games? <laughs> um, Mike Bithell Games is not the final name of my company. Okay. Um, no, it was basically what that was, was, um, you know, I, this is a boring story. Well, it's, it's really interesting if you're me, but oh. I made money. I made quite a bit of money, and when you make quite a bit of money, you have to sort out things like taxes and accountants and companies and all this. And it was basically, I had 24 hours to set up a company. Um, and it was like, God, I'm not going to come up with a good name, so I'll come up with a deliberately awful name, which is Mike Bithell Games Limited, um, <laughs> which doesn't fit on my company credit card, which is <laughs> just flawed. Um, and eventually that will change. It has to change, because right now I'm working with a team of about nine or ten really talented people, and I don't feel comfortable saying, this is a Mike Bithell game. Ignore that guy in the shadows over there. This is a Mike Bithell game. Uh, that feels weird to me. So I kind of want to change that. And there will be announcements in that area. OK, thank you very much, Mike. No problem. Cheers. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, my question is about, uh, to uh, with, with Thomas alone, there was the narrator. I, uh, his name escapes me. Danny Wallace. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, is he going to be in uh, part of volume? And uh, what was the story of how you originally met him? Okay, um, so there's I as as long as Danny goes along with it, I'm never going to make a game that doesn't have him in. Um, turns out that was the best choice I ever made professionally. Um, he's brilliant. He's a really great actor, and you know I wrote a script, and I'm proud of the script. But that guy gave it life. Uh, so yes, he's in this. He's the AI of the volume you're in. Uh, and he's, well, he's been, so the, vo the volume, the machine you're in, is actually there, it's a military training tool. And Danny's the military training AI. So he's basically like, he's the paperclip from Office, but if the paperclip from Office was obsessed with guns. Um, and, and really doesn't think this whole sneaking thing's gonna work out, but you know, if that's fine with you. And he's responsible for the AI. He can't really do AI, that's why they all walk in that really weird, contrived way of kind of back and forth like that. He's not good enough at the AI to produce something realistic. By the way, that's the best get out of any game design <laughs> problem I have. Um, yeah, so he's back. He has to be, he's a big part of my games from now on. To answer your question about how we met, <laughs> um, I got drunk. Um, I got drunk. I, I kind of, I'd been writing the script, and he was a big influence. I'm a massive fan of his, of his writing, and also his kind of, he's a DJ, and he does his audio books. If, you, if you've not heard his stuff, you need to go out and listen to and read everything he's ever done. He's amazing. And I was kind of, not emulating it, but I was listening to his stuff, a bit of Douglas Adams, all the stuff that I was into while I wrote the script. So it had kind of elements of his voice in it. And then I tried to find a voice actor who could do a Danny Wallace impression. Um, and there's surprisingly few of them out there. Um, turns out the best guy at Danny Wallace voice is Danny Wallace. Um, so I, basically I got drunk, found his personal email address on a weird stalker fan site, um, emailed him a build of the game and said, hey. And well, I didn't say hey, I was much less cool than that. I wrote him an essay about how brilliant he was. I was, I was quite drunk. Um, I wrote an essay about how clever he was, how great I thought he would be in the game, um, sent it to him. What, I didn't, what I'd forgotten is his first job was as a video games critic uh, in, for a magazine. He worked at a bunch of the games magazines long, long ago. Um, not long, long ago. He's not that old. Um, he wouldn't like that. Um, <laughs> and he played the game, and he liked the game. And I think I got an email back from him within an hour saying, yeah, let's do it. And then obviously you, you, know, you talk to the agent and you do all of that stuff. But yeah, he was basically, he was in in a very short period of time. Charlie, who's the star of this, Charlie McDonald, who plays Loxley, uh, again, in a pub. Um, I was in a pub with some friends, and I was telling them the story. They were asking me about the game. And I said, basically, he's kind of like if Charlie McDonnell was Robin Hood. And just one of my friends at the table was like, oh, I know Charlie. Do you want his phone number? And I don't know how these things keep happening to me, but they, they do. And I'm not going to question it. Um, so yeah, that's my answer.
All right, okay. Thanks. thanks a lot. Is there any more questions, or is Tom coming up to end uh, our... Conveniently, we have actually run out of time. So, oh, okay. uh, thank you very much to Mike. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Cheers. The devil in your eyes When you love me You're sweet as pie You got me wrapped around your finger, darling And it hurts me like razor blades and lies